Right, so shall we do the what we've been watching stuff sure. first then? You, do you have your list ready? Why, why do I even ask? Of course you get your list ready. <laughs> so I live my what life. Lots of lists. Lo- oh, I suppose I'll be, it'll be which list rather than <laughs> So, Mary, what have you been watching? Do you know, I've actually been very TV heavy and obviously not live TV because nobody does that anymore. But I've been watching quite a lot of series. So I watched Fallout, which I don't game, so I didn't really know anything about this going into it. But I absolutely loved it. And I feel like people are just waking up to the fact that Walton Goggins is amazing. So Mm -hmm. long may that continue because he is and he's brilliant in this. I thought it was really well done. And also, you know, picking up some handy tips for whenever the apocalypse does eventually happen, you know. <laughs> good, good to know. I also watched Baby Reindeer because everybody in work was talking about it. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go home and watch this. And I mean, it it's insane. It starts off, obviously, the first three episodes, you're kind of like, this is cringy, kind of funny. And then it, it just gets so dark. And it's mm-hmm. obviously, you know, about dealing with trauma and the sort of stalking element of it's almost a kind of non-entity in comparison to everything else that goes on but I really really enjoyed it but needless to say the internet being the internet everyone's now trying to find out how the, who the real people are and it's like well you've obviously not grasped the point of this program um, but I mm-hmm. thought it was, it was really well done and they uh, yeah it was uh, very very emotional in, in parts as well I've also watched a couple of Scandi series. So the first one hit Netflix on Friday. So I just binged it on Friday night because the episodes were only about half an hour, 45 minutes. That was mm-hmm. called Deliver Me. And that's about two young boys uh, who get sort of caught up with a, a criminal gang. And I'm not giving anything away. The show opens with one of the young boys being shot. And it's just about, you know, questions about what's it like to grow up in a child... A, with these two kind of different opposing types of childhood because one of the boys comes from quite an affluent middle class house but there's a lot of stuff going on in that house and the other boy's a a, a refugee living with a, his four siblings in a, in a flat and how did they become friends how did they end up in the gang what have the police not picked up on that they should have so it was just it was really interesting I thought it was really really well done and quite hard hitting there was a lot of violence towards children which I feel like you don't mm. ever see on no. TV but this was quite quite brutal um so because i like that i went and found another thing that the director had done called snow angels which i'm currently watching on all four or whatever it's called these days um, mm-hmm. so i'm three episodes into that and that is equally grim but you know, <laughs> I, I don't tend to do that much light-hearted stuff i finished the bridge as well which was excellent i loved that uh, and i also watched midsummer night because my friend rona recommended it basically it was about a bunch of people in midsummer in Sweden, getting pissed and spilling all the family secrets, which oh. was funny and tragic in both parts. But the thought of just being this like middle aged Scandinavian woman in a caftan just getting pissed and revealing that you know so and so's done this and that did quite appeal to me actually. I was like, yeah, that's what I want to be when I grow up. I also have watched we get sent two screeners, so thank you very much to Ruth Marsh and Ken Stevenson who sent their screeners in. Ruth sent us That They May Face the Rising Sun which won Best Film at the Irish Film and Television Awards and I reviewed that for the site. That was excellent. I really, really enjoyed that. It was such a an immersive experience watching it. It did really feel like you were actually in the sort of Irish countryside in the 80s and part of such a strong community that were all sort of chipping in and helping each other so that was a really good watch Mm -hmm. and I also watched A Girl Upstairs which is a kind of horror thriller mystery film about a reclusive painter who somehow brings two of her paintings to life one with much better consequences than the other and the ending of that film in particular really got to me I was like oh this is quite clever I like this so that was really really good but that's all I have watched as I say it's been mostly sort of tv heavy I've done a Mm -hmm. power of reading as well so I was desperate to get my hands on the new sort of I say the new the lost 
Gabriel Garcia Marquez novel, which was called Until August, which I picked up in Toppings in Edinburgh. It's it was gorgeous to read. It was just you know, obviously he's such a, I love reading his his writing and albeit this was a kind of, it was a novella so it was quite short, I, I just didn't want it to end. It's about a woman who goes back to her mother's grave every year and every year she goes back she has some sort of tawdry love affair with whoever she can pick up at a bar and it was, it was great, I loved it. And I noticed that Netflix have picked up 100 Years of Solitude so oh, well, everything nice. costs that it's not shite. <laughs> 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 That's because that's such a big novel, mm -hmm. I think, to take on, and there's so much to it. And so I've only seen a clip, and it doesn't give anything away. So as I say, we're hoping it's not shite. I've also read, trying to incorporate more Palestinian authors into my reading. So I've started Mornings in Jenin by Susan Abelhawa, and I like that so much. I then bought another one of her books, so it was quite, it was very, very moving. I kind of sobbed sort of semi-frequently when, when reading that. Obviously, it's very hard to, to read about things that Palestinian people have been subjected to with, and you can't really do that sort of without breaking down a wee bit. Um, I also read Unwell Women by Eleanor Cleghorn which is a history of how women's physical and mental health has never been taken seriously and basically how I mean honestly some of the highlights include in ancient Greece sometimes they would bang plates near your fanny if they thought your womb had moved and you had become hysterical. All right, uh, yeah. They also thought that if you looked at a man while you were on your period it would give him leprosy. And obviously there was the whole thing about witchcraft, you know, anyone who had a mole or a freckle was a witch and all this sort of thing. So it was a really brilliant read, but also very frustrating. And I think anyone who is female who's gone to a GP and the first question they ask you is, are you pregnant? That's what you just get dismissed with all the time. So mm -hmm. it was a very, very good read. I've also read I Who Have Never Known Men by Jacqueline Hartman, which was recommended to me, but I really didn't like. And The Art of Losing by Alice Zenitor, which was about the French colonisation of Algeria. So I'm doing cheery in my reading list and my viewing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, all, all good stuff. Just definitely, I'm going to focus back more on films now that I've done my sort of TV series viewing out the way, but yeah, uh, all, all very good stuff. And what did your live-in games correspondent think of Fallout? <laughs> he loved it. I think he was so nervous about what they were going to do, but I think because it's not like a... It's not a rip-off of a game. Like it has its own mm -hmm. story. It's not it's not like The Last of Us in the sense that it does follow the story of the game. This is sort of its own world, as it were. So I've yeah. been informed. And it kind of does its own thing. Now it's obviously setting itself up for a second season at the end, which I believe is I've been reliably informed is Fallout. Is it New Vegas? Is that what it's called? Uh, yes, I think that was the second. Or no, Fallout well, Fall three and then Fallout. There's a Fallout 4 and New Vegas and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's been there's a whole series of them, so which incorporates more than just... Yeah. Uh, I think game, it has a sufficient amount of twists and ca good character development as well, like especially mm -hmm. with Walton Goggins, you know, the ghoul. There was a lot of backstory there, and there was a couple of episodes where you were, like, you know, quite shocked by, I think, what was happening. Matt Berry cropped up. That's always a good thing. He's got a great <laughs> voice. But no, he, Chris absolutely loved it, and I think that's... I think it's always hard with games because there's been so many instances where yeah. the adaptations have just been terrible. I think uh, Fallout and obviously The Last of Us have kind of broken the mould a little bit. But maybe it's the format. Maybe they just don't work in a, in a film structure. Maybe because these two are TV series and they've had time to sort of flesh things out. Maybe that works a wee bit better. Well, I think it's what you said earlier with Fallout and that it's not following any one particular sto storyline from mm -hmm. the games it will incorporate elements from them and incorporate characters but it's basically a story that's within the the universe the world of fallout and they can do what they want with that. they can make something new that seems to be the the best way to do it with some games whereas the likes of the last of us is a narrative game there's mm -hmm. a whole story, but with Fallout, I think there's a certain amount of open world elements to it. Where you can go and do whatever you want. <laughs> you, there's lots of weird, uh, sort of side games and things that basically just distract you. I mean, the main, main game may only take you 20, 30 hours, but you can spend hundreds of hours doing lots of side games and all this sort of stuff. So, yeah, I totally get why doing something with the world rather than trying to make us an adaptation of the story itself yeah. from one of the games works a lot better and i think you'll probably see that happening more and more because it's like a borderlands game 
coming out as well towards yeah, uh, the yeah. Borderlands movie adaptation yeah. coming out later this year, I think it is. And it's only going to be the, the beginning of these sort of high-end uh, adaptations, I think. And there'll be a, a lot of game studios looking and going, well, we could make money off of this. Especially, I mean, obviously, Sony have tried it a few times. They tried it with Uncharted to a, a mm-hmm. reasonable degree of success. But, yeah, these are sort of, they're big. And probably because of TV rather than movies. They've got more time to expand on ideas and storylines yeah. and things like that. Yeah, kind of makes sense. It's on my list of things to watch. I just haven't got around to it yet because I've got so much other shite that I want to watch or have been <laughs> watching. So it's definitely it's, it's definitely worth it because I mean I sat down and I was like, look, I'll try the first episode. If it's good, you know, I'll I'll stay. If it's not, this can be your thing. And I was I was really, really bought into it from the from the offset. But I think a lot of that is there is a quest element to it. So there is a sort of people mm-hmm. have to get from A to B sort of thing. But I do think the characterization is is extremely, extremely good. And as soon as I saw Kyle McLaughlin, I was like, well, I'm staying to the end. <laughs> yeah, yep, quite right. Myself, I have been watching a reasonable amount of movies. Again, I watched the first Omen, the original Omen and Omen 2, which I won't bother going into here because we're going to <laughs> in preparation yeah. for our podcast. So that's quite interesting revisiting these films. I realised that I hadn't watched Omen 2 since I think it was like 1983 or something. I saw it in video of all things. Wow. Um, I know, I know. And I thought, I don't know if I even remember this, but then I saw a couple of bits in it and I thought, I remember this very well now because it was some of the horror bits in it were uh, very memorable, let's say. As soon as it kind of just about to happen, you're going, Mm, yep, no, it's going to happen here. So, yeah, it is pretty good, <laughs> decent stuff. But as I say, we won't bother talking about them because uh, we're going to go into a bit of an in-depth Special discussion. Pod. Yes, yes, probably as our next one. I watched Madame Web, which Ooh, was thoughts. it was not great. It wasn't oh. as bad as people are making out, and it wasn't bad enough that it was good as in a sort of a, a oh. hate watch or anything. It yeah. was just a bit rubbish. The performances were flat. The story was a bit all over the place. And I think part of that can get put down to the rewrites and the edits that were done, sort of the uh, post-production work and things like that. But at its core, it just wasn't a particularly good story, I don't think, which is not oh, great. I feel and so bad for Tahar Rahim. I really like him. I know, I know. And it just didn't look as if they were actually interested in performing, which was which was not great. Anyway, no. Yeah, I also watched Anatomy of a Fall, which was fantastic. Ooh. It's really. Oh, I good. love that film. Yes. Yeah, it was excellent. Very, very good indeed. I was riveted, especially because it was based on uh, a legal system that I don't quite understand. The French legal system. Mm-hmm which just seems completely nuts. The The performances were all very good. Sandra Huller was just amazing. The prosecutor guy I thought was a wee bit over the top because he was always badgering her and making snide comments and things like that, and I thought that was a bit unnecessary because he was able to do that without employing these sort of tactics because he had a reasonably strong case, obviously which kind of jarred a wee bit, but, you know, that's it was a totally minor thing. I did really enjoy it. Yeah. I also saw The Book of Clarence, which is... a. Is it? it? was okay. Tonally, it's a bit strange because it starts kind of almost like a comedy because he's right? this sort of minor person in Palestine during the time of Jesus. Jesus is actually a prophet and he's got his... Mm-hmm. Uh, 12 apostles with him he's, and I was going to say Entourage that's right they've got an actual name <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> apostles that is the word yep <laughs> yeah. so they're all there but he's somebody who's just struggling to make a living and he's a bit right. of a con man and all this and he sells drugs <laughs> and things and he sets himself 
up as an alternative messiah to Jesus. Now, it starts off as quite comedic and everything and what he's doing. And his brother, his twin brother is Thomas, one of the 12 apostles, Mr. Right, Doubting okay. himself. And of course, Thomas doubts him all the way through the film. So he's playing a dual role, Lakeith Stanfield. Lakeith Stanfield, is it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and it starts off this sort of quite comedic way but then it gets really dark and it you kind of get that from the very opening scene because you see him getting crucified and then it goes back to his <laughs> wallet it's a chariot race it's between him and mary magdalene they're having a chariot race for money i know i know i know so tonally yes it is all over the place performance wise really good really enjoyed yeah. the, the performances but it was a bit of a strange one because you're kind of saying well where are you going where are you supposed to go from the- here I thought from the trailers it was almost like Life of Brian esque. Yeah, yeah, and in a way it is, but then it mm-hmm. gets very serious and very, very dark in points, and you're kind of going, "This, this isn't what I was sitting watching a few minutes <laughs> ago," you know. So yeah. it was a bit, a bit nuts. I also saw uh, Challengers, Luca Guadagnino. Oh, uh, everyone's raving about this. It's a good film. Uh, it's a good film. Zendaya's fantastic in it. She's really good. She portrays a character who goes from the age of about 16 through to about the age of maybe early 30s and she does it really well and it's all done through hair and makeup she's got more adult hairdo for her being (laughs) for being this very old woman but yeah it's a a really good film and the tennis and it's actually really good as well and it's it's an excellent story It, it works really well and you're kind of really involved in it all the way through and it's obviously this triangle between her her husband and her husband's old doubles partner who fell out basically over her and all this so yeah it's it was a cracking movie really good i also saw abigail the horror film well i saw i say i saw i saw about an hour of it i was pulled out of the screening uh, because my daughter phoned me and told me that her car had broken down on the motorway so i only managed oh, to see no part of it oh it got fixed and everything they came out and she's okay and, oh yeah she's absolutely fine she just she pulled into the hard shoulder and called the AA and got them to come out so yeah it was all right but abigail which i knew nothing about before i went in is a, a loose remake of i think it's the daughter of dracula an old okay. uh, horror one universal horror film from like the 30s, in fact, I think it was called Daughter of Dracula to begin with. And it's about these people who kidnap this girl, basically because they've been told that she's worth a lot of money. Her industrialist father wants to, or her industrialist father will pay a lot of money. And they take her away to this old house, this old mansion style house, and they, they, they keep her there. And then they find out they're actually trapped in there with her rather than the other way about so it was pretty right. good it's it really really strange though because the the young girl who plays abigail the mm-hmm. last film she was in was matilda she was leading matilda this oh, sweet little right, girl okay. and then she's going to this other one and she kind of uses that same energy in parts of it as this little sort of innocent girl but yeah it's it was, from what i saw of it it's pretty decent so i'm going to try and yeah, catch the second half of it. Apparently, it's one of the most bloody films out there in terms of the amount of blood that they used. And oh, I was just right. starting to see that, and I was kind of thinking, "Oh my, this is this is going a bit <laughs> full on, you know." But it's not like it's it's a horror film. But it's not like horror creepy. It's all like in your face yes. kind of idea. It's yeah. it's very very sort of. It's one with Dan film. Stevens. Is that yes? Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, he's he's very good in it. He, he rocks a really good pair of glasses on it. A very sort of seventies pair of glasses. So. It's, it's pretty good, yeah. Enjoyed that. What else? Oh, because we were talking about it the other day, I watched Nightwatch as well. Oh, uh, okay. So you you wait, said you had the... I'm struggling to find a double DVD. You said you have it, don't you? I've got DVD of both Nightwatch and one of Daywatch yeah. as well. And I've had them for a bit... Is it must have been 10 years or something, and I've never watched them. And it was just because you guys were talking about them, and I thought... Looked on the shelf and they're both sitting there. So I dug out Nightwatch, gave that a, a viewing, and it's good. It's a good movie. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. So I will move on to Daywatch at some point, probably this week, because it's cool. good. It's, the only thing is, obviously, it was meant to be a trilogy. So, and the trilogy was never realized. So, but I don't Ooh. think it'll take away from watching the, the what second. What was the film. other watch? 
I don't know. Right. I don't, I Dave, really, I, maybe Nature Watch or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Crime Watch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that, that was pretty decent. Enjoyed that. TV wise, started watching the Netflix series Ripley, which is very good. That's Black and white take, is taking yeah. its time with its story. It's very, very nice indeed. I don't really want to say very much about it because you kind of well, I suppose you know the story anyway about him yeah. going to try and bring Dicky back to America. So I've only really watched the first two episodes of it, and so far, yep. Really enjoying it. Started watching 1883, which is on Paramount, which is a precursor to Yellowstone. The oh. Kevin Costner mm -hmm. uh, drama, it's a sort of Western, modern Western drama with us, is one that's based in the year 1883 when the family are just setting out cross country to where they're actually going to settle. There's a couple of them getting made. Basically because I think they're not making any more Yellowstone because Kevin Costner and Taylor Sheridan fell out over lots of things, including money and stuff Jeffy. like that. So it was meant to be seven seasons of Yellowstone and had to finish after five. So they're doing these prequel ones. They've done 1883, they've done 1923, which has got Helen Mirren in it. I think it might actually... Right. I'm not sure if Harrison Ford's in it as well. I'm not sure. And there's going to be one that's set during the Second World War as well. But it's all sort of cowboy stuff. And it's, it's pretty decent, mm -hmm. actually. It's pretty good. Uh, it's a wee bit annoying in that one of the, the main characters, the daughter, she narrates at the start and the end of each episode. And sometimes the stuff that she's saying is really, really annoying. It's all about, <laughs> you know, and I saw the sun said, and it was really pretty, and you're going to oh, fuck off. Just go on with the story, for goodness sake, you know. You know, <laughs> I can understand no, why it's there. It's I wanted to get in <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I want to see more Indians, you know. So, what else? I watched, I don't know if I said before, I watched The Three Body Problem on Netflix. Which, yeah, you did, which I've yeah. put on my list since you mentioned it, yeah. Yeah, and I also started watching Three Body, which is the Chinese version of it, which... Right, okay. Um, you're you're was, really deep diving on this one. Yeah, the, the Chinese one was released last year, I think it was, and it's the whole thing. It's all three books in this 30-episode arc, but mm -hmm. it's, it's okay. It's all right. The subtitles are quite annoying on it because they're white. And it sometimes they disappear with whatever background, but ah, it's, oh, right. it's okay. It's not too bad. What else? I started watching Death and Other Details, Mandy Patinkin drama oh. on Disney. It's a it's a murder mystery. He's the greatest detective in the world, and he's on a boat where there's this. Well, it's it's all very contrived about all these people being on a boat and somebody gets murdered, and he has to figure out. Who did it and it's all the conflicts it's a 10-part thing and it is pretty decent mandy patinkin is excellent and pretty much everything he does so <laughs> i am enjoying that it'll be quite interesting to see how that develops and it kind of works quite nicely because i'm also watching only murderers in the building as well so oh, that's so good yeah uh, i'm only through halfway through the second season of that at the moment so i've got plenty still to watch yeah. of that one so yeah that's that's pretty decent book wise reading wise not very much i'm still piling my way through comics watch uh, watching reading a lot of 2000 dd comics which is just fantastic it's just really really good i'm up to i think the tail end of 1978 now uh and wow. it's interesting to see some of the things actually in the comics that you would not get away with now there's a couple of stories Right. And it, there's one where it's only just, it's almost like a, a cartoon strip that you'd be getting a newspaper as, and it's only like three or four panels. And it's so racist. It's unbelievable. It, it really has a go at Chinese people. Uh, the Chinese people are okay. evil in it, and they are made out in such really bad caricatures. And I, I know this is from like 1978, but in a kid's uh -huh. comic, it's just you're kind of going, Phew. but at the time you wouldn't have thought anything about it because that kind of thing was done all over television, you know, 
Saturday night prime TV. You would have Jim What's Davidson. It Mickey Rooney and Breakfast at Tiffany's oh, yeah. for fuck's sake. Yeah, yeah, pretty much the same idea. The big teeth and the, the funny really? accent. Yeah, yeah, and, and like the wee heart and all this sort of stuff. And it was just like, you know, they would never, ever bring something like that out now. But obviously you're not going to retroactively cancel something from nearly 50 years ago. So, well, I suppose you can, but, you know, it's, it's the <laughs> that, way I, was gonna say, I think there's quite a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. Or they at least uh, come with a trigger warning or a viewing warning or a reading warning yes. or whatever. So I'm actually surprised that that's not there. Yeah, they're starting to do that in some of the streaming services, aren't they, with older content? Yeah. They, they yeah. put warnings on it or just notifications saying, you know, that, uh, contains outdated language or, yeah. Exactly, yes. Outdated attitudes, that kind of thing. Yep. I don't know if it's said before, but I previously got the Paul McCartney book, the lyrics book. Which is a big two volume set of McCartney's lyrics. And for each one, there is, oh, it can be just a paragraph or it can be like a couple of pages on that particular song about the time he was spending, like making mm -hmm. the song or what it was about and all that. So I've been doing that. And at the same time, like I, I like have a read of the lyrics, a read of the blurb, and then listen to the song because there's a Spotify playlist with all the songs on in order, because it's all in alphabetical order, and it's all in alphabetical order from his whole career. And that's pretty decent. It's, it's quite good, because you just listen to one or two that's a day. And, just, yeah. and it's a lot of times it's stuff that's like album tracks and things like that, so it's not just all the big hitters, because it goes right through his whole career, because it's a good couple of hundred songs right in there. And that's pretty excellent. Otherwise, I've been to a couple of concerts over the last week or two. Nice. Um, classical concerts rather than popular music beat combos so <laughs> last week just to be clear john was not in a mosh pit <laughs> yeah <laughs> so last week i went to see what was it hosts the planets yeah. uh, the rsno concert of that at uh, the concert hall and that was brilliant the mars the is it mars the warbringer is the first part of the suite and it's just it's amazing so bombastic and stuff it's really good but the supporting program was really good as well there was one of them which i cannot remember offhand but it had sort of shades of bernard herman's hitchcock Ooh, type of work like which that. had been yeah. obviously done before herman's time this was done maybe the, like the turn of the century and i cannot remember who it was and there was some elgar stuff in there as well it was like an old british nice. so, so you know i I should have gone along wearing a St George's cross around my neck and <laughs> demanded pieing mash at half time, you know. But <laughs> and uh, last night I went to see uh, the RSNO again. Went to see Petrushka, which is a piece by Stravinsky. It's actually a ballet, but a lot oh, of the time we just play the music from it. Petrushka is basically the story of three puppets who come to life and they have basically falling out. Petrushka and the girl uh, start to have a relationship. And then there is the Moor, the character of the Moor, which is another, pop, uh, another puppet which kills Petrushka. And then Petrushka comes back from the dead to haunt them and then dies again. Now, if this sounds a wee bit familiar, it's because it's the same story as Punch and Judy. Petrushka is the Punch character in Russia. Okay, uh -huh. And that was really good. That was like a whole suite. It was maybe about 35, 40 minutes, and it was excellent. But the, the highlight of the evening for me was a piece by a composer called Eska Pe Pekka Salonen. In a, it was a Scottish premiere of a piece called Nyx, N-Y-X, and this mm -hmm. was absolutely fantastic. It just there was always something on the go and it would go up, it was high mm -hmm. and low and high. And it was just amazing. And it used, I think there was about 85 members of the orchestra on stage at the time. So the sound was amazing. It was, wow. I think it was like five double bass players. So there was this big like, drone going on at times and everything. And it was just excellent. It was really, really good. It was kind of the highlight for me of the, the whole evening. But yeah, it was it's something that just sounds amazing. Live it was music really always good. makes you feel very emotional. I think even if it's mm. something that's quite upbeat, it still makes you feel very emotional because like that's you know, people you know who have perfected their craft essentially. Mm -hmm. You know, yep. but, yeah, I love I love that. That sounds amazing. 
Yeah, and all working in unison, obviously, as well. Mm-hmm. You know, it, just the, the logistics of getting so many people to be doing the same thing at the same time is quite extraordinary. So, yes, and like you say, when you hear an orchestra live, it's just unbelievable. There's nothing like it recorded, I don't think. It's just not the same, no matter how good your sound system is. It's just obviously yeah. being in a, a purpose-built auditorium, so you're actually hearing the sound. So, yeah, it's really good. I think we're going to start going to more stuff like that because it's like they, they have stuff on. They have a whole season on, and it's like every Saturday or every other Saturday night, and it's a couple of hours. Usually it's about two yeah. and a half hours maximum. And if you, you know, you sort of get season passes, you actually get, you know, you, you buy them in, you know, like five concerts, you get money off and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I think we're going to try and do a few more f- things like that because it was pretty decent. Enjoyed it. So, yeah. Yeah, that so, yeah. sounds excellent. Yeah, that was me. So, fairly busy when I actually look back Big on cultured. it. Big <laughs> cultured. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But obviously, you have your own cultural experiences with the the shitload of books that you've been reading. You must be holding them too, like one in each hand at a time. <laughs> them... I think I think the thing is, I am quite a fast reader, so but I've mm-hmm. always been a quite a fast reader. But with some books, I've been like like that, you know, Unwell Women. I was properly taking my time and like because I think sometimes it's quite easy to read a book quickly and then you put it down and you forget about it and you're like oh I actually have read that and it's so I'm trying to sort of be maybe a bit more purposeful with it but I think for me in particular I'm as I say I'm trying to read more sort of like Palestinian authors and I'm trying to choose subjects I think will challenge me I mean I still will always go back to like my my Joe Desbos and my my Scandi crime dramas and all that because I I just Mm -hmm. love them but I'm trying to choose things that I think are maybe a bit more challenging to to read or at least will challenge maybe my perspectives on things so yeah my my Goodreads is account is a is on fire though <laughs> no that's good because um, i like learning new words i think that's yeah, a, like yes there's so many times where i think that you assume because people read a lot that they just know every word <laughs> which is just not true there are so many times where you look at a book and i love having to google a word and find out what it means and then mm-hmm. work out what the pronunciation is as well because i don't want to ever drop it into conversation and it's funny because it was like what is I don't know if I've said to you before, like the word awry <laughs> obviously mm-hmm. is spelled like Ori. Yeah. <laughs> so when I was reading it, I was like, oh, Ori. And then I was using the word awry <laughs> in a different context in real life. Because I thought <laughs> they were two separate words. So now when I'm looking up words, I try and listen to the pronunciation as well, just in mm. case it is a word that I have heard before. Uh, and I just don't know how it's pronounced. But yeah, no, I just I love reading. I could read all day every day if I was allowed to. And it's been fitting quite nicely because I've been doing more sort of episodic things, as in like television. I've been fitting my reading around a bit more, so I have been doing quite a bit more reading than, than if I was going to mm-hmm. see films consistently. But yeah, nice. Still not, it's still not opera or classical music though. <laughs> well, well, I, we've got two things coming up. I think I'm going to see La Traviata in the middle of the month, in the middle oh, of next month, yeah. and I'm going to see the Thirty Nine Steps at the end of the month. There's a That'll production be brilliant. of that. It's one of these ones where there's only like four or five performers actually on stage. Oh, so the parts. Yeah. Yeah, lovely, lovely. I love that kind of yeah, thing. I think that's at the I think it's the Theatre Royal. It's at, it came up ages ago and because I've got a you know, you get a theatre card and you can get mm-hmm. cheaper you get like first night discounts and stuff like that. So it's actually it actually pays for itself reasonably quickly. And you get ten percent off the bar, so it's only really expensive rather than Horrendously expensive. <laughs> yeah, it's only twenty quid for a wine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we 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 get that every year, and it works itself out quite nicely. And because of that, you get you know emails and all sorts of stuff to say, or oh, this yeah. is good, you know pre-booking and all that sort of stuff if you actually want it. And like I say, you get money off. But and the thirty-nine steps is one of them. I booked it probably this time last year. And I said to Leslie, you know, do you want to go and see a show next May? And she said, oh, next month? No, 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 next May, the year after. So, uh-huh. and uh, aye, Ugh, it all works. It's all, it's all good. There's a lot of stuff I wouldn't go and see. Like, there's a lot of stuff at the Kings I wouldn't go and see. There's a lot of this jukebox musical stuff. And yeah. also, and it seems to be there's a lot of podcasters doing live tours and things like that. Yeah, which, I've noticed a I, lot more I can of get that. with some of them, but not, not with all of them. You know, I just don't, I don't understand 
how they can put they can all pull in an audience. But you know, there must be if they're pushing forward with that anyway. Okay. Are you right. saying we should try it? <laughs> no, I'm not saying we should try it. The, the last thing I want to do is go up and sit on stage and try and talk for an hour and three quarters and actually have people not throw things at me. And not say anything that we can't edit out at a later date. Yeah, exactly, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, I can just, I can just see us uh, being discussed in Newsnight or something, you know, at some point. <laughs> well, that was something else I watched. I watched Scoop. The oh, how Emily is Maker. that? It's really good. I really enjoyed it. It's, it's funny, and the the characterization in it is really excellent. It's totally spot on. Gillian Anderson is very good as Emily Maitland, and Rufus Sewell is just superb as Prince Andrew. He's such an arse in it, and he's just he has no idea whatsoever. He just he comes across as being this totally clueless you know, middle-aged man who just thinks because of his privilege and everything that he can get away with anything he wants and see anything he wants and it won't be questioned. Sounds very accurate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, I was that was really good. I really enjoyed that. So but I just obviously had forgotten. In fact, I will write that down so I can add it to my list of stuff that I have actually watched because I keep a wee list on maybe of all the stuff because oh, nice. on my account I can I just mark a you know, like uh, what stuff I've actually rated and uh, what I've added to my watched list, which is sitting about, I think it's just over a hundred things for this year. So, which is not That's bad, really but good. it's no, but if you think about it, the amount of stuff that you've watched over the last couple of months as well. So, especially with film festival things and all that and all the TV stuff. So, That's yeah, true. it all works in. 